Good morning. What a wonderful way to begin our worship to the Lord, first in singing and then in praying, and now to witness the testimony of believers who are following the Lord obediently in baptism. This is Michael Bell. Michael, have you indeed invited Christ to come into your life and be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. In obedience to Christ's command, because you have made a public profession of your faith in Him, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with our Lord in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. This is grandfather and granddaughter. This is Steve Knuckles and Annabelle Horst. Steve, have you invited Christ to come into your life and be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. In obedience to Christ's command, upon a public profession of your faith in Him, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with our Lord in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Annabelle, have you invited Christ to come into your life and be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Master, upon a public profession of your faith in Him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with our Lord in baptism. Raised to walk. In the of life. That's good stuff, isn't it? Amen. Let's all stand. Praise the name of the Lord here in this place today. Give thanks for always, all thanks to the Father in the name that is above every name. In that name, there's freedom, there is power, there is healing, there is salvation. So let's sing it today. Is the name of Jesus wonderful? Is the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to Him and have their sins removed. Is the name of Jesus wonderful? So beautiful. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Son of God and one of us, lover of our soul.
Thank you, Jennifer. And I hope that's your testimony today. I got saved. I hope you were remembering back to the time that you invited Christ to come into your life. And if it's not your testimony, I pray that it will become your testimony this morning. We have been looking at the book of Genesis, seeing the beginning of many things, but also seeing how the beginning is not the end. In the early chapters of Genesis, we find much that explains the world as we see it today. In chapters 1 and 2, we saw how God created everything that was in the universe. And that explains what we see today about the order and the complexity, about even the design and DNA that is so far past human understanding, we're just really beginning to understand it, much less be able to make it. 
It explains living systems and quantum mechanics and all the things of great mystery. We can understand why it is so far beyond human capability and yet it exists and it has existed when we understand it's because God who can do all things created everything. In chapter 3 we saw the fall of man into sin and it helps us understand why in our world we look around and we see sin is so prevalent. And in chapters 4 to 6, we saw how sin that began in the life of one woman and one man spread into all mankind. And we see why sin is so terribly pervasive because all have sinned. And then we looked in chapters 6 and 7 and saw the story of the great flood, the reality of God's judgment on sin. And at 8 and 9, we saw Noah's deliverance. And here's the first picture of grace, because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he found that grace because Noah was a person of faith who believed in God. And so the Scripture tells us all the way through that we too can find grace. We can have the grace of the Lord in place of judgment on sin when we come to Jesus Christ through faith. That grace always is delivered through faith. Now today, we come in chapters 10 and 11 in the book of Genesis to the instance of the Tower of Babel. This is a little known and often misunderstood portion of the scriptures. But I will tell you it will explain much of what we see in our world if we will just give heed to what the word of God says. It will tell us the origin of races and of people groups in the world. It will tell us the origin of the multiplicity of languages that are in the world today. It will even give us an understanding of cavemen, of the, of the records that we have that at one time men, women lived in, in caves and how they progress in societal development. Have you ever wondered in, in just reading through the early part of Genesis and you read about Adam and, and Eve and they certainly were not cave people and yet society began to grow immediately after them and talked about the building of cities. Where were the cavemen? Where do these guys fit in? Genesis 10 and 11 tells us where they fit in, how we can understand. You know, when Noah led his family off of the ark, the very first thing they did was worship the Lord. Folks, that in itself is an important truth for us. That of all the things that we need to do in our week, and all of us have, have long lists, either written or digital or mental, about the things that we need to do during this week. And this day, the Lord's Day, is the first day of the week. We need to be reminded sometime that the most important thing that we have that we ought to begin with is the worship of the Lord. And you recognize that you're here. I know all of you are, are busy people and you have busy weeks planned. But here at the first day of the week, the first part of the day, you have come to worship the Lord. That's what Noah did. And the scripture says that God blessed Noah and his three sons and Noah's wife and their wives. God blessed them all. And God renewed the command that he had given to Adam and Eve. He said, Noah and all of your family, Noah, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You're just eight people now, but I created man to fill the earth. So go forth and cover the earth with people. 
because God desired for the earth to be filled with people who would be living in fellowship with him. God wanted people all over this globe to be living in relationship with him. And even though all of them were sinners, because the sin nature had passed down from Adam and Eve, and and we see very quickly, even after Noah got off the ark, though he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Noah was just like you and me. He was a sinner. And the scripture shows that. And all of them were still sinners. But God had said, one day, I'm going to provide someone who is going to take away the stain of sin. Someone who is going to to conquer over sin and over death. And until then, God gave them the blood offerings that they could offer as a picture of the one offering that would one day be made to take away their sin forever. So until then, he would provide a temporary covering for their sin as long as they made the sacrifices by blood, picturing the one sacrifice that would one day be made. Genesis 11 opens with a statement that quite honestly ought to be obvious. But because of its importance, it is stated very plainly so our understanding will be clear it says now the whole earth had one language and one speech of course they did I mean they were all descended from Adam and Eve they however were not necessarily all the same color as Adam and Eve had So Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives had the genetic potential for their physical appearance to have any of what we would call the ethnic distinctions today. So what happened? What happened to move from this one family who were all of of one speech, all of one, one language, to move to where the world has multiple languages and people groups with racial distinctives. What happened? Well, Genesis 10 shows us that for about the next century, after no one and his family got off of the ark, and they began to, to have, have children and began to multiply, but they began to move together. Now, if the Mount Ararat, where the ark landed, is the same mountain that we know as Mount Ararat today, very likely it is, but, but we don't know, we cannot trace the name far enough back in history to know that with absolute certainty. So until and unless the ark is actually found undeniably on Mount Ararat, we won't know for sure that it's that same mountain. But if it is the mountain that is today located in Turkey that is known as Mount Ararat, Noah and all of his family and their descendants began to move to the southeast to the eastern edge of what today is known as the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia. Now, around the time, a little more than a century, when the Noah's great-grandchildren began to be born and were raised, then the whole lot of what had now become a very, very large family moved to the east, moved westward from the east to a large plain that is located in between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. That plain was called the Plain of Shinar. The region later becomes known as Babylonia. We know the area today as Iraq. This portion of their migration proved to be the highway to tragedy. Why? 
Why was it a highway to tragedy? Well, first, because it was after they encamped on the plain of Shinar that the family began to follow a new leader. Up until this time, it seems that Noah was still the man of influence and leadership. But now, as the family had moved to the plain of, Shi of Shinar, there arose a new leader named Nimrod, who was a rebel. He was a great-grandson of Noah, the grandson of Noah's son, Ham. And we read a little bit about him in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. The name Nimrod itself actually means rebel he was known not only as a hunter but the word there for hunter is sometimes used to mean a hunter of men a killer of men and Nimrod effectively became the king over all of those that were living and he led them to build cities throughout the plain of Shinar what we read happened next was done by the people under the leadership of this rebel named Nimrod. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. In following Nimrod, they disobeyed the word of the Lord. God said, go, multiply, fill the earth. Now they were multiplying, but the people said, but let's stay here. Shinar is a good place. We've got all we need. We've got water. We can grow food in this place. And let's build a, a tower and let's make ourselves famous, make a name for ourselves and stay here. So they built a tower, literally a ziggurat. And in building a tower with its top in the heavens, folks, that does not mean that they thought that they were going to actually build a tower that would go up past the stars and into the third heaven, the residence of God. These were not primitive people. These were not foolish people. Remember, at this time, Noah and his sons are still alive. These are the men with their own hands and their own tools and the knowledge that God had given them built the ark, a ship, the, a ship that was the size that was not duplicated again until the day that the Danes built huge barges. Many, many, many centuries later, Noah and his sons built that tremendous ark. They were not primitive people. Now, I think we can say with certainty by what we read later that Noah and Seth and, and probably a few others of the family did not participate in the building of the tower because the purpose of the ziggurat was worship. Ziggurats were built as places of worship and not for worship of the one true and living God who had created heaven and earth, but in order to worship the gods of the land. And so when it says a tower that reaches up to the heavens, it was because at the very top of the ziggurat would be a temple. 
And that is where they would go and they would offer their sacrifices to these false gods of the land. And so it was called the top of heaven where they offered their worship. That is why this place, which we will read in a moment, was first called Babel, is later in the scripture called Babylon. And the whole region called Babylonia. And if we follow the name Babylon all through the scriptures, we find out at the very end in Revelation that Babylon, this place, the city built in this place, is called the mother of harlots. Harlot in the scripture refers to spiritual adultery where people go after other gods and worship other gods rather than being faithful to the one true and living God. And the scripture calls this the mother of harlots because this was the beginning of the worship of the other gods, the false gods of the land. In response to their disobedience, in response to their stubbornness, in response to their worship of false gods, God confused their language in order to prevent a one world government that was opposed to God from taking root in the land. Let us read in Genesis 11 verses 5 to 9. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused them. From there the Lord scattered them abroad. Here on the screen are 19 of the presently 94 recognized language families of the world. Linguists used to think that all of these language families could ultimately be traced to a single prototype language, a single prototype for them all. But more recently, many have recognized that this simply is not possible because the difference in the sounds that are used in those languages, the difference in the structure of the languages between any two of these 94 families are so great, the the differences are so large as to make a common prototype impossible God confused the language and in doing so he began all of the languages that are the family of languages of the earth and what was the result of that what was the result of his confusing the languages so that each family spoke its own the result was the scattering of families all over the face of the earth. Now they, they that had lived together and were able to communicate and work together and fellowship, now they couldn't talk to anyone outside their immediate family. And so each immediate family began to scatter, began to move out to establish its own way, to go to its own place. And in fact, Genesis 10 and 11 give us the record of where each of the families went and of the area in which they settled and where they began to develop and to build. As families were isolated by language barriers, 
dominant characteristics in that particular family's gene pool began to express themselves in what we would call ethnic characteristics today. However, even as we see t- today, when two people of different ethnicity marry, then their children and their grandchildren can very quickly begin to lose those ethnic distinctives that are apparent in, in one's color and in one's look. All of this, folks, tells us two things that are of great importance. One is that the biblical account is the very best explanation of exactly what we observe in the world concerning ethnicity and language. As always, when the evidence comes in, the Bible proves true. The second thing that it tells us that is of great practical importance to all of us is that all of humanity is really one family. We are all related, literally. There is no biblical, genetic, or biological support for racism at all. You know, this is exactly what Paul was referring to when he was preaching in Athens. He he said, and this God that you do not know, he said, he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He said, God started with with Adam and Eve, but then when we come down to, to Noah and his family, again, from one blood, God made every nation to dwell on the face of the earth. Folks, what happened in Babel also explains the discovery of remains of so-called primitive men. And you will often hear the anthropologists talk about those that were the hunter-gatherers and those that lived in caves or other very basic dwellings and and had very few tools or sophistication. But let me ask you something. What if all of a sudden everybody around you spoke a different language? Only your immediate family spoke a language where you could communicate with each other and you could not communicate with anyone else. And if you were forced out into the wilderness, because remember that in the day in which we're talking about the Tower of Babel, there were only a few cities that had already been built in Shinar. And so as the people went out, they were literally going out into the undeveloped wilderness. So I want you to picture yourself, even even now, with your knowledge, with your understanding, with your education, with your training, but picture that happening to you right now. And suppose that one of the satellites up in the sky that can peer down on us and take photographs and read our newspapers and look at our iPhones, whatever else they can do. But suppose one of those is is trained on your family so that every once in a while it just snaps a picture to make a, a record of what happened as your family was isolated from others and you went out into the the wilderness. Well, what would you do? I mean you can only carry what, what you can carry on your back. <laughs> Poor Jeremy and Amanda carrying all them kids. They couldn't take any tools with them at all. <laughs> but, but, but in the rest of us, we couldn't take many. I mean, we might, we might pick the, the tools that we think would help us the most and we would carry that. We would all be very limited in what, in what we could carry and if they broke, then they were gone. But as the satellite took our picture every once in a while, do you think it might catch a picture of the family trying to gather food from the land the best we could find something to eat? Because there's no stores to go to. 
Do you think it might find us eating the meat of some animal that we had figured out how to kill? (laughs) Do you think it, it might record a smile on our faces if we figured out how to make fire after whatever matches we carried with us ran out so we didn't have to eat the meat raw? Might it take a picture of us trying to make tools the best we remember that they were made starting first with wood and stone and then if we were really smart or if our children grew up and they were really smart or our grandchildren were really smart and there was surface ore in the area we might begin to learn how to make some things of bronze and later of iron. Do you think if there was a cave nearby that didn't have a resident bear, you might move in and let that be your shelter? Folks, that's exactly what happened with all of these families that left from the Tower of Babel. They left having great knowledge having tremendous understanding they were not primitive they were not stupid they were not unlearned people but they were forced into isolation and out into the wilderness so what do they do they follow the rivers they follow the streams where they'll have fresh water they gather what food they can they kill what food they can and they begin the development of civilization and all of them go through the exact same things we would go through if it happened to us through a stone age where things are just made with wood and stone and then through a bronze age and then to an iron age on the way to civilization and sophistication that is exactly what happened with them But folks, the skills of civilization is not all they lost. You see, when each family left Babel, every one of them had the testimony of the one true and living God. Remember, Noah and his sons are still living. Noah knew the grandsons of Adam personally. Their lives overlapped. So Adam knew well what had been passed down about the truth of creation, about how God had created everything and what had happened in the Garden of Eden and all the story up until his own life. And then they all knew firsthand what had happened in the flood. So every person, every family that was there at the Tower of Babel, they had the testimony of God. They had the testimony of the flood. They had the truth that God sends his judgment upon sin. They had all of this truth, but as they moved away, they moved away also with hearts that had turned to the worship of the gods of the land. And so they had the memories like of the great flood, but they had hearts that worshiped gods which are not gods. And that is why in almost every ancient culture today, you find some story about a worldwide flood. It's not accurate. It does not match the details that we have in the scripture of the the true great flood, but there are resemblances. Why? Because they remember that from old granddaddy Noah telling us about it. And these memories were passed down through the generations and maintained in their culture and later in their literature because they once had the knowledge of God. But they willingly lost it it wasn't that they never knew it was that they willingly gave it up and that's what Romans 1 is describing to us beginning in verse 18 
where it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Because, listen to this, although they knew God, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. And that is exactly what we see in the archaeological records of the civilizations. That though they had a history where they knew God, they gave it up and began to make gods that could be manufactured with their own hands in the shape of men, or birds or animals or a combination of all of those things. Most of these families that spread over the earth, forming the people groups of the world, willfully lost the knowledge of God. Now, as clearly as the Bible explains to us this highway to tragedy, the focus of the scripture is actually on the opposite it tells us about this but it just it just tells us in a brief period of time here we just get a glimpse of this but the focus of the scripture is on the path to triumph now unlike the highway on which almost everybody walked to tragedy the path to triumph would only be one man wide now as many as would desire to walk upon it would be able to walk it but only one at a time the path would be through one descendant of one man whose name was Abraham and we'll begin to read his story next week but one of his descendants would be the one that would provide this path to triumph. And Isaiah said, and he is going to be a suffering servant, a, a man of great humility that will give his life for all the people of the earth. He would be the one and only son of God who would be identified to us as Jesus of Nazareth. And he would open the path to triumph. How? Not by the rebellious action like Nimrod, but by being obedient. Obedient to his heavenly father. Obedient to him even to the point of giving his life upon a cross. And by his death and resurrection, Jesus would offer forgiveness of sin and eternal life. To who? To people of every tribe, of every tongue, of every nation, of every people group of the world. And in fact, again, when we go all the way through the scriptures and we get in Revelation and we are taken up before the throne of God and there a great crowd of people are singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And we see who they are. They are people clothed in white robes, which is picturing of the righteousness of Christ because they put their faith in him. And they are from every tribe, 
from every tongue, from every people group on the earth. And he has brought them to himself. Folks, and through Jesus, all who trust him can have a true knowledge. Not just about God. Not just to have the, have the facts correct about God. But to actually know him personally. As you know your father as you know your mother, as you know your brother and sister, as you know your good friends, to know him personally. And that's what it means to be saved. To be saved is to enter into that personal relationship with God through faith in Christ so that you actually know God personally, individually. That's what it means to be saved. So let me pause here and ask. For I know that, that so many of you here today, uh, you could sing that song Jennifer sang. Probably couldn't sing it as well as Jennifer sang it, mo most of us. But, but you could say the words and that'd be true. I've been saved. I've been saved. And that's your, and that's your testimony but for all of us who are saved, let me ask you this question. Do you know God better today than you knew him at the beginning of this year? I mean, here, here we are, four months gone by. Do you know him better now than you knew him four months ago? ago not just information about him but I mean knowing him personally may I just share with you real quick three things you can do that will help you get to know God better every day the first thing is simply reading your Bible regularly now I like to say some every day but David, we, we had a secret church with David Platt, head of our International Mission Board, and he said, look, if you can't do it every day, do it four days a week. You know, just, just say, I am going to read it, but read it regularly, even if it's four days a week, but read it regularly. Now, any plan, and there are all kinds of plans out, any plan that will take you through reading the Bible with regularity is a good plan. If you've never done this, if you, if you just don't, don't know the Bible, if doing this would be something new, let me, let me suggest to you start in the New Testament. Start, start there. Now, let me share with you a plan that has helped me in the past, one that, that I have found helps me in gaining an understanding of the Bible as a whole. Start with a gospel, any of the gospels, and then read the book of Acts. Then go back and read another gospel and then read Romans. Now, some of you are writing this down. You don't have to write this down. If you want this plan, I've had them printed up there at the welcome desk and the whole plan's right here. All you gotta do is pick one up. Now, if you've got another plan, like I said, any plan is good. But this is a good plan to help you in understanding the whole of scripture. Then read another gospel and then read from 1 Corinthians all the way through Jude. These are a bunch of short little, little letters. Read through that. Then read the fourth gospel and then the book of Revelation. Now, if you will do that, even for just four days a week, about 30 minutes a day, do you know you can read the entire New Testament in about three months? If you, if you read slow, maybe four months. But three or four months, you can, get, you can get through the entire New Testament. Now, here's my suggestion. Especially if this is new. Or if when you finish reading, you still are saying, mm, what did I just read? I still don't really have it. Read it again. Do it again. Start back with that same plan on the New Testament. Read a gospel. Read Acts. Read a gospel. Read Romans. 
Read a, read a gospel, read the letters. Read a gospel, read Revelation. Keep doing the New Testament every day or four days a week until you come to the place where you say, I'm getting the hang of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I understand it all, but I'm, I'm getting comfortable with this. I'm, I'm starting to see the life of Christ. I'm starting to understand the teachings of Christ. I'm starting to, to see how those kind of interrelate with the other things that are written in the New Testament. So after you've read it, you know, two or three or four times, whatever it takes to come to that level of comfort with the New Testament, then start with the Old Testament. But I'm going to suggest to you, don't just start with Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus. Start with Genesis. Read Genesis, then go back and read a gospel. Then read Exodus. Go back and read a gospel. Then read Leviticus. Then read two gospels. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you need to, read a gospel. You know, read numbers. Read numbers read a, a gospel, read Deuteronomy, read Acts. And then read a couple of books, a few books in the Old Testament, and then read a few more in the New Testament and go back and forth, old to new, old to new, until you've read the, the whole thing. Folks, and by doing that, you will learn the, the interrelationships and references that are made in the Old Testament. All of a sudden, you'll come to something in the New Testament and say, Ah, oh, I know what he's talking about. Or you'll read something in the New Testament and say, Oh, well, that ties in with what I read back here in the Old Testament. And you'll start to see the Bible as a whole because remember, it just has one author. You know, God, God used more than 40 people, but God is the one that sent this word and it will all begin to tie together for you if you'll read through the scriptures and so on. But now, read. Read for about 30 minutes a day and then pray. Just, you, you've been reading the word of God and God's been speaking to you through the word. Now you pray and you just talk back with God. And just, just talk with the Lord. Spend some time in, in praise and thanksgiving and then just tell him what's on your mind. Ask for his help or his guidance in the day. Pray for those around you that you, you love and are in, in difficulty and lift them up to the, to the Lord. So spend a few minutes in prayer. And then the third thing, I said three things that'll help you know God personally better. Read his Bible regularly. Pray go to church go to church because if you'll do that you're going to find things as you read the word even things that are going to come to your mind in prayer and you're going to say but what about this but what about that folks we all need the community of believers and we come together and, and we worship together and we study God's word together and we're blessed to have others like our life change group teachers and, and other people that are in the class who have been do doing this a lot longer than we have and so they can help point us to some places for answers. If you'll do those three things, they'll help you do what God had purposed for all of mankind upon the earth. And that is not only to be saved through faith in Christ, but to get to know him better every day. Now, for those who have not yet trusted Christ, I want you to remember, he too talked about two ways. We've seen in Genesis, there was the highway of tragedy, but the path to triumph. Jesus said essentially the same thing. He said to the crowds, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the And there are few who to somewhere. Every one of us in this room is on the road to somewhere. Either we are on the road 
to tragedy and to destruction or we are on the road to triumph and to life through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In our time of invitation, I'm going to ask those of you who are believers, those of you who have trusted Christ, as we are extending the invitation to those that need to trust Christ or those that, that need a church, church home, would you spend some time deciding what you're going to do to grow in your knowledge of God personally? Not just your knowledge about God, but how are you going to get to know God better? In Bible reading, in, in prayer, in, in faithfulness with the body of Christ, decide what God wants you to do to make that step to know him better. For those of you that have not trusted him, this is your opportunity. In a second, we're going to, to pray, and then we'll stand, and then we're going to sing. And when we sing, if you have not trusted Christ, if you have not yet through faith in him entered into this narrow way, into this path that's one man wide, that leads to life and to triumph, you can through faith in Christ today. You just step out from where you are. You come to me or come to Brother Mark who will be here and just say, I want to trust Christ and we'll help you from there. If you just know you want to trust Christ, we can help you from there. If you know the Lord but you don't have a church, we invite you to come. You come to one of us. Say, I want to be a part of this church. If as you're deciding about what you're going to do, about getting to know God better, there's a, there's a need for you to come and pray. The altar is always open to come just get on your knees here at the steps and just lift those burdens up to the Lord. While we stand together, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you make your purpose so very clear that you want us, each and every one of us, to live in relationship and fellowship with you. And you have provided the way. While humanity has broadly walked the highway of tragedy and has thus been separated from you across the centuries, you have always made a path. Noah found that path because he believed, he had faith, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's always been individuals across time that have believed, that have had faith, and you've provided grace for them to be saved. Now you want that to be all of our testimony, to say, I've been saved. I've been saved. I pray for those that are here today that have not yet been saved. I pray that they will be saved today by coming to faith in Christ. But Father, I pray for all of us who are saved. I pray that we would not be content just to have a basic relationship of salvation by having trusted in Christ, but that we would want to know you more every day. That's what Paul said. He said, I want to know you more. I want to know you more. May that be the cry of our heart. Lord, I pray that your spirit will just lead us to see the things that we need to do in our lives that will put us in a place to get to know you better in a personal kind of way. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. You come as we sing.